You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. Dot com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again. For a little program we like to call Around These Parts, TWIFO This Week in Futures Options. The program or the name pretty much says it all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is out there in the futures options market. So we're going to talk, as you might imagine, a little bit of action out there. Who knows? Maybe the ags, the metals, the energy, equities, never know is going to come across our radar every week. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-compelling network upon which more and more of you are binging every day. Remember, if you're of the legion of on-demand listeners, you like what you hear, keep rating and reviewing. This show is really kind of the only show of its kind out there that does a deep dive into futures options, the skew, the volatility, the volume, the unusual activity, all that good stuff, and a whole bunch more. So if you like futures options, there are other people out there who may be in a similar boat who maybe just don't know it exists because, again, it's, uh, there are not many people talking about this stuff, which is crazy to me given how much mind share it is capturing in the broad public right now. But if you like what you hear, keep rating and reviewing. It does help all those folks who are struggling to find information on these markets. Helps them be the path to our door. And, of course, if you like what you hear, you want to go above and beyond, join us throughout the week, not just for TWIFO, but for the Option Block, recently voted the number one options podcast out there as well as Options Bootcamp, one I know a lot of you know and love on the educational side, OPR, Volatility Views. You want to get access to our great exclusive pro content like our pro Q&As, Options Oddities. You want to be part of our giveaways here. We're stocking up giveaways as we speak to head out the door to you folks. You know where to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash secret club. And however you listen, while well, you're listening live to me right now, if you're after the fact, on demand, somewhere in between, who knows, 
Keep sending in those questions, those comments, maybe a product you'd like us to talk about on the show. We do love to hear from all of you folks out there. And you know what? We're not messing around this week. We're getting right into it. A lot to talk about. Let's dive right on into the Movers and Shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Movers and Shakers report, the portion of the show where we break down everything Lighting it up over there at CME this past week to the light side, a.k.a. the upside, and to the dark side. And a lot going on this week. You guys can see this report for yourselves if you follow CME or if you follow us on Twitter. We both put it out right before showtime. You could see that it is about two-thirds dark side, but there's a lot of middle ground. So in terms of the big movers, the biggest movers seem like, well, we have one big one (laughs) to the dark side. But the big movers are going to be to the light side this week. So I think we shall start there. Number five, cost you about 3.5% move to break into the top five this week. That gets us to gold. You know, a frequent topic of conversation is and has been for quite some time. And, you know, is gold underperforming in light of everything that's gone on over the past couple of years? And I think the answer for most people was, yeah. And then (laughs) coming into this year, it seems like gold heard that criticism and said, hold my bear, kid. Let me see what I could do, because it's been on the rampage the past month or so. And uh, breaking through the 2000 level, gold breaking into our top five this week as well, up 3.46%. Number four, it's KC Wheat up 4.36%. It was number five in the same direction last week, up uh, mind-boggling 17.86%. Of course, the more active contract of the two is the Chicago Wheat, the SRW Wheat, the soft red Winter wheat, say that five times fast. So maybe we'll get into that a little bit later today. A number three is platinum, 4.71%. Palladium up 7.14%. Palladium has been on the rampage of late. I do believe it hit a new all time high recently out there. Again, I wish, I wish we can. Maybe we'll pull it up today to see how many contracts it does. But it's somewhere, I think, around three. <laughs> okay, number one this week, listeners, back to the ags. It's soybean meal up 9.95%. Now, to the dark side we go. Number five is the NASDAQ 100, off 4.35%. Russell 2000, right outside our bottom five, off about 2.5% this week. Number four, our old friend Lean Hogs, off 4.73%. Number three is Bitcoin, off nearly 7%, 6.75%. Number two, it's Lumber, back in our movers and shakers this week to the dark side. Only at number two, though, not number one, off 7.74%, because Euro dollar is kicking them to the curb saying... Uh, number one for this week off 19.4%. Again, take some of those numbers for euro dollars with a bit of a grain of salt. It is an enormous product with many different expirations all kind of popping off around the same time. Sometimes it's hard to get it. an aggregate percent move <laughs> out there. Uh, but still, impressive move out there nonetheless. But you know what? A lot of the the headlines, the mind sheer, the consternation out there over the past week has really been been focused on two product complexes, the ags and energy. So I think we're going to head out there first. It's time to get our hands dirty exploring the latest options, trades, and trends in corn, wheat, soybeans, and more. It's time to talk ags. All right. Welcome to the world of ags, listeners. And actually, we did ask you guys right before showtime, a little bit of a flash poll. So what do you guys want us to talk about this week? Crude oil, wheat, gold, or all of the above, and pretty much all of you choosing all of the above. (laughs) The only exception, the only other votes coming in were for wheat, with about 30% saying just wheat. So obviously, we got to hang out in ags this week. I got a feeling all of those are going to make it on the show this week, though. And man, what a week it has been in ags. You know, I know a lot of you don't trade the ags and the grains. It's kind of more just an, an interesting product complex to watch. And if you listened to our guest last week, Carly Garner, you might be thankful for that because she was saying, if you're not trading wheat right now, you should be thankful because it was kind of a, a worst case scenario. Usually, if you're trading the options and you want to hedge them with the futures, you know, you guys know from trading stock against your options, you have a pretty reliable hedge. In the futures market, though, there are some caveats that can kick in in these wild markets. And that's pretty much exactly what we saw over this past week. Let me break down the the tail of the tape for wheat just over the past few sessions out here. Let's go back to right after our show last week on Friday. 
The front month future in wheat, the Chicago wheat, this is SRW wheat. By the way, listeners, you guys know where to go to find all this. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O is a place to go. Then go into that drop down, go into the ags. It's easy. It's right at the top of the list. It's an alpha order list. Then go into the grains and oil seeds and then SRW. That's where we're beginning our journey this week. If you did that, you would see that that front future, that's where a lot of the max impact was felt on that future that's going out tomorrow. It was $860 last week by monday session it was 1294 it had rallied exactly 50 percent they talk about an explosion this is wheat this is not you know a biotech this is not a meme stock this is wheat this is our food supply 50 percent increase just over the weekend i mean that's what carly was talking about where if you're not in these markets maybe be thankful because you have options against that. Maybe you, in her case, she was short a lot of them, but she had long futures to hedge that. The long futures are stopped out because they only have a limit and they can't move anything more than that limit. So they're limit up pretty much every day. And that's all you're getting out of your hedge. Meanwhile, your short options positions and your spreads are just exploding because they're still printing and they're trying to interpolate where the future is going to be. Obviously, no one knows for sure. So the markets are crazy wide. They're crazy illiquid. Your shorts are getting marked against you horribly while your longs are not getting anything to help you. It's kind of a worst case scenario. And that's exactly what was happening last week. Wednesday, we were limit down. We started to see some of the pressure easing a bit. There was talk out of the EU. Maybe the French could step up their wheat supplies. So you don't talk about French wheat a lot, but this week it was a big deal. French wheat coming in and they were offering a big sale of French wheat out there and they hope maybe that could help ease some of the demands. We're obviously also stepping up here. Big wheat exporters here with uh, corn export sales, 2.17 million tons USDA reported last week. That's well above the expectations. Uh, Soybean exports, uh, about 3.1 million tons That's up 38% from the week before. So our farmers are obviously kicking into high gear, shipping this stuff to A, where it's needed, and B, where they are paying a heck of a lot for it over there. So a lot to to parse. As we're coming into showtime, wheat is back down a bit. It's not quite back to the 860 level. It's kind of splitting the difference. Is that about a 1083 when we kicked off the show? So it went from 860 all the way up to about 1300. And then back down now to about 1083. So, yeah, what a what a roller coaster. This is this is like GameStop stuff we're talking about, listeners. But these are huge liquid futures markets that, unlike GameStop, which is just a speculative bubble and kind of a nonsense, this has real world impacts for all of us. If you go to the market, you buy bread or whatever the heck you're going to buy that involves wheat products, which is a lot of things. Those are going to be more expensive now. So, yeah, it's it's. It's this vicious cycle we have out there. So let's parse it. How much paper is going up this week in SRW wheat? Well, you know, the fact that it's kind of been locked limit a lot has weighed on it a little bit. Only 162,000 contracts out there. We saw more going up, I think more than 2x that last week. So interesting stuff out there. Uh, Of that action, about 41% coming in the May contract out there. That one is about a 1083, like we said, coming into showtime. The vol, if you're wondering, last week the vol was exploding. Vol coming in a little bit. You can thank the French. You can thank our farmers for that, stepping into the fray. Vol at about a 67 right now in that May contract. That's off almost 25 points over the course of the past week. Again, these are not underlying moves. These are not vol moves that we're used to seeing in a product like wheat. So this is this is rarefied air. It's the old Chinese curse listeners may you live in interesting times and we are all living through them together right now as of last week the puts were 8.1 percent cheap to the at the money so nobody wanted them and the calls were 12.1 percent bid this week the call is still bid 11.1 percent bid but the puts they came for them with some gusto they're 31 percent discount so 31 percent cheaper than that at the money vol in good old SRW wheat right now. So if you want to come in and scoop a 25 Delta put, listeners, you're paying roughly 30% less from a vol perspective for those puts, which is interesting. And again, if you're coming to this from an equity mindset and equity bias, that may shock the hell out of you. Usually it's the other way. It's close to 30% premium for these things. And so an intriguing time, uh, maybe if you're thinking this uh, downside can continue, you have blown through some strikes already, but still obviously could have a bit of a ways to go if you think this could uh, continue. 
perhaps there are some bargains to be found on the lower portion of that put wing. Let's get on out now, see what the most active contract was this week in the old Chicago wheat. It was the 900 puts. So speaking of said put wing listeners, the 900 puts. So these are about 180 points out of the money right now going up 5,500 times. The big day is today, 2,300 going up today, about 1,000 yesterday, 2,000 on only a few hundred on Monday. It looks like opening throughout the week, obviously, given our skew action, uh, maybe a lot of selling on these, which is kind of interesting. Maybe I think that's a little bit of a bridge too far, but either way, interesting stuff. Also, right behind it, 5,300 of the par puts. I expected more action there. That's obviously a nice round number, even psychological barrier. We just blew through it not that long ago to the upside. The par puts doing about 5,200 contracts this week. The big day was yesterday, about 1,600. A lot of that was closing, so taking some of that off the board. So that could also exacerbate things as well. As we're getting closer to those par puts, maybe some folks taking those off saying, hey, we're not going to get there, but I'll take what I can get. <laughs> and so that could also be hitting uh, hitting the skew out there as well. Uh, 1,500 going up on Monday, 1,000 on Tuesday, and about 1,000 today as well. Also, not all puts all the time. The 1,200 calls also trading actively. All these doing about 5,000 contracts this week. So this one's actually about exactly 5,000. 5,006 to be precise. The big day was today, about 1,900 today. 1,756 yesterday, slightly opening there. 1,300 on Tuesday, slightly closing there. And a whopping 12 on Monday <laughs> when it hit its apex <laughs> for the week. So it looks like a lot of back and forth on the call wing there. They were opening, they were closing kind of throughout the week. So interesting stuff. It is interesting to see how much they are crushing these puts now normally you move down the skew that's kind of what you'd expect but this kind of sharp and aggressive and crazy of a move usually may add a little bit more vol into the spectrum and we're not exactly seeing that which is kind of interesting let's look really quickly let's go a little bit farther out see what else we're seeing farther down the curve actually you know what listeners i may have buried the lead it wasn't exactly the 900 puts that won the dance because they were edged out by 250 contracts, by the 1,400 calls in December, going up 5,750 times this week. Almost all of that today, 4,800, 1,400 calls going up in December. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering, that future out in December, a little bit lower than this one, obviously. It's over 100, 110 points lower, 971 and a half right now. So actually, it looks like it might have been a vertical. Looks like the 1300s also trading 4,000 times. So a bit of a funky ratio vertical, but, but looks like 1300, 1400 vertical going up in December. Again, if they're buying that vertical, then they expect another aggressive pop in wheat through the end of the year. Again, that future is over 100 handles lower than the front future that's going out very soon. So they need a heck of a move. And if they're selling that, that might make sense because they're buying the 1400s to hedge themselves. We did just get up to pretty much exactly that level on Friday. So obviously you can't say we can't get there again. Could be there tomorrow. <laughs> Limits may kick in, but a few days from now we could be there. But yeah, that's an interesting vertical. Usually we see the weird upside in the metals. These days it's in the ags, which is kind of fast. Also 700 of the 1200s going up today. Doesn't look like it. That could be 11 half, 1200, one by two going up as well. All sorts of weird strikes, listeners going up and it's all today so that's kind of interesting out there i need to dig into those a little bit more so Dees also on the docket maybe some folks looking for a little bit more tumult through the end of the year here in wheat which again looking we have an equity poll going up right now what folks think about vol through the end of this month and if those numbers are anything to go by folks are not expecting this vol this tumult to go away anytime soon at least for the next month or so obviously this is going out well beyond that but intriguing stuff here we also have to go out where since we're hanging out in the ags our number one mover and shaker this week was actually soybean meal to the upside so let's head out there next that one a little bit quieter from an overall volume perspective but still doing a lot of paper this week Fifty-five thousand contracts that's a lot for soybean meal if you don't follow soybean meal it's had quite the pop <laughs> Like we said, it's up about 10% this week, 9.95%. It was trading 455 last week. It's at about a 484 right now. It's up another 23 handles or 5% just this week. So he extended all the way back to our show last Thursday. It's up 10% from there. It's at about a 483. I said 483 and 484. So 485s are at the money strike. 
And of that, about 55,000 contracts looks like a little over a third, about 39% coming in that May contract out there, listeners. So we're going to hang out out there. If you're wondering, what is the vol in soybean meal? Something people ask me all the time. Well, that vol is about a 32 and a half, off about a quarter of a, excuse me, three quarters of a point. But so it hasn't really changed much this week, kind of staying firm, which is, again, that's kind of equivalent to uh, where VIX is right now. So that's kind of equity vol <laughs> right now, which is kind of interesting. Uh, skew wise, last week, the puts 4.9% cheap. This week, the puts almost 10% cheap. So puts coming in from a vol perspective. Last week, the calls were 7% rich. This week, almost 10%. So calls getting bit up. Puts coming in as we continue to rally out there, which is actually kind of the polar opposite of what you'd expect. If it was a normal skew move, you expect the calls to come in and the puts to get bit as we rotate that skew along the axis there, the at the money. But when it's a sharp move like this, all bets are off. And that's kind of what we're seeing out there. Even though interesting to see that they're coming for those puts. Let's see if we can find out what's going on out there. The number one trade out there this week was the 500 calls. So what would be the par calls out here looking at about 3,100 contracts. Again, this is not this is not Euro dollars or even S&P E-mini out here. We're talking smaller numbers here, but still pretty active this week. 3,100 contracts for our number one trader out here this week. That is the 500 calls here in the May contract. And they're pretty active all week. The big day was Tuesday, about 1,400 all closing. 800 going up on Wednesday, 800 going up today. It's like closing throughout much of the week here. So, so let's see how high that future got. So we were 455 last week. We've got up to pretty much uh, here is pretty much the high right around four right now 484 or so so uh, that's kind of our our high for the week so it looks like maybe some folks thinking perhaps they're going to give up the ghost on the par calls or perhaps uh, loading up on those maybe they were short that strike and buying them back to close because the vol did get a little bit juicier out there so let's let's lean that way right behind it also were the 460s so now in the money calls going up about 2,500 times, almost all of that today, 2,100 today. Also, the 450s going up today, 2,100 times. So, all of their paper. So, it looks like a bit of a weird vertical going up out there. A lot of verticals in the AGs these days, which is kind of interesting. Okay, let's see if we can see any other aberrant paper before we roll on out of soybean meal listeners. Let's go a little bit farther out, see if there are any surprises lurking for us, like there was in wheat. And it looks like the 500 calls are kind of the the trade du jour across the board, July, they're trading as well. 500 calls also trading out there in March of next year. So still trading the 500s all the way out that far. So intriguing stuff afoot. It wasn't all calls, though, listeners. If you go here to the April contract, the 440 puts did trade about 2,100 times this week. The big day was yesterday, about 760, 400 and change pretty much every other day this week, back and forth, opening and closing. But there were some puts on the docket this week as well. So kind of weird paper afoot out here and a kind of weird product, soybean meal, not one we talk about a lot here, but kind of inescapable out here in the ags listeners. But you know what else we got to get to? It is top of mind for a lot of you out here. It is the energy complex. So let's get to it. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. Looking at our chat here, they're saying they're waiting for the market to spiral downward next week. Well, yeah. <laughs> given some of the paper we were just talking about on the option block uh, last show, I, that wouldn't surprise me. Let's go on out now to the land of energy. Is energy going to spiral down? Is it going to keep skyrocketing north? Let's find out here, listeners. Go into that drop down. Go back to get out of eggs, which is the top of the list there. You're going to go down about three slots to energy there, listeners. going to stay on the top. They're going to go to crude oil first. And then WTI, everyone's been talking about WTI, well over 100, threatening the 130 level. Let's see the, the sordid tail of the tape that was that front future in WTI, which is going out in about a day. So we saw a lot of living packed into, <laughs> packed into that future out there. And let's see, that future that got up to, let's see, coming into showtime right now, WTI is at 106, about 106 and a quarter so. Quite the retreat from its lofty highs. This had quite the saga, too. Last Friday, WTI, this exact future, was trading about $91. So the day after our show, shy of the par level, $91, shot up over the weekend, coming in on Tuesday, hit 123.70. That was kind of the high for this kind. It was a lot of talk about 130 
oil out there. But this contract hit 123, about 124, and then started giving up the ghost after that. By Wednesday, it was back down to 108. And right now, where it is right now, right around 106 and a quarter. So it's net off, right? Nine and a half points, about 8.2% on the week here for WTI. So the story has been mostly downside this week after just gapping up after the sanctions we, we imposed. And of course, all of the talk of banning actual Russian imports to the U.S. recently as well. Hit 14-year highs out there in WTI. So again, these are not levels anyone was looking for out there. And of course, we've all seen the photos of you know lines at your local gas station, kind of a flashbacks to the the dark days of the late 70s and early 80s and the last OPEC gas lines everyone remembers here. In the- I was a wee babe. I don't recall those, but I have heard talk of those days. So intriguing stuff, maybe a little bit of ray of sunshine out there for all of you who were maybe sweating these high levels. Oil, after setting those new 14-year highs, gave up about 12% in a day. It's worst day since around November of last year as kind of all these shocks to the system continue to be digested out there. And let's see what we got on the tape this week in WTI. By the way, my goodness, I can't remember the last time we saw a 1 million contract day out there in WTI. Usually listeners will see around 300 something, an active week 400, 450. We're more than 2x that right now. You're talking five, 600. That's a pretty crazy week. 1 million and nine contracts on the tape right now. My goodness, that is E-mini. Those are Euro dollar numbers right there. That's, that's a lot of paper. There are not many products on the planet, listeners, that can put up a million contracts. You know, if you come to mind, obviously VIX and a few others can, can do that. Apple can do that on a regular basis. But that's kind of a rarefied club and WTI just exploding into it this week. And of that, 26.5%, so 264,000 contracts going up in the April contract that goes away, of course, in about seven days. Let's go a little bit farther out just to see what the heck we have going on, even though it has been a crazy week. Maybe we should suspend our rules just for this one week, listeners, because you kind of want to play a little bit closer to the fire to see exactly what the hell's been going up. So tell you what, we'll do a little bit of a twofer out here. Uh, we'll go first to this April contract that was has seven days to go. And that one, the vol, if you're wondering, 82 and three quarters off about 16 points this week. The vol in the other contract I was going to do, which is the May contract, that has about 35 days to go. That's at about a 69 and three quarters. So a wee bit lower. <laughs> That's off about nine and a half points this week. Skew wise, let's go out to the April contract first again. Take some of these numbers with a grain of salt because it's less than a week to go. 5.6% cheap were the puts last week. Now this week, 15.2% cheap. So the puts getting annihilated. The calls last week, 7.5% rich. This week, 183 So the calls getting bid up aggressively. Now, when we see a sell-off, we tend to see that type of thing. And this maybe is a little bit more extreme, but still interesting stuff out here. If we go out to that other contract, yeah, the April contract did about 16% of the paper this week. That contract, the puts were 5.3% cheap last week. This week, 10.5% cheap. The calls last week actually coming in, though. 12.4% rich last week, 9.7% rich this week. I would expect a little bit more of that given what we saw here this week. But again, it is a crazy topsy-turvy week. In terms of the most action, what is leading the dance out here? Remember, we threatened that 130 strike, if ever so briefly, out there, listeners. So if you said the 130 calls... (laughs) <laughs> going out in April, you are the winner, winner, chicken dinner. 23,104 of these going up this week. The big day was yesterday. 8,000 going up yesterday. 5,000 going up on Tuesday. 6,852 today. 3,251 on Monday. It seemed like they were opening on Monday, which makes sense. We were kind of, that's right when we were threatening that level. And then we're right about starting to race towards it. And then closing pretty much every other day this week. So once we got to it or maybe failed to hold it, that's when people may be starting giving up the ghost, even though it looks like it was a lot of back and forth trading as well, because it wasn't huge closing numbers on either of those days, which also makes sense. You know, you expect to see these crazy new strikes were breaking through. You expect to see a lot of churn and burn trading around those strikes. And that seems to be exactly what we were seeing out here. 
That was the big dog. Then we go out actually for number two listeners. If you're thinking, we're just talking about wheat and how they were pricing in a little bit of action, perhaps if they were buying that vertical throughout the rest of the year. Well, WTI also coming in to say, perhaps hold my bear because the 150 calls in December were the number two most active contract this week. Listeners doing 21,000. 772 contracts. I know that's what a lot of people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear 150 by the end of the year. Oh, my goodness. But that is what the paper is up to right now, listeners. The big day for these was Monday, 95.85. It's like they were taking most of that off. So maybe they had some long part 150s, I should say. And we were, once we blew up to that 130 strike, they decided maybe to get the heck out of Dodge. We did see opening, though, the rest of the week, 5,300 on Tuesday, 3,000 on Wednesday. Almost 4,000 going up today. So new opening positioning on the 150 strike. That was followed hot on its heels by the par strike. Doing a similar amount of paper, about 19,500 contracts all week long. It wasn't even day after day, so it wasn't like it was straight 100, 150 verticals. Also, that's a pretty strange vertical. It's a very wide vertical to be putting on if that was the case. But the par calls also extremely active. So maybe that could give you a little bit of solace, listeners, the if you're spooked by the notion of 150s trading through the end of the year, maybe the par calls can bring you back to earth. Those traded about the same number of contracts, right around 20,000 contracts. The big day for those was Wednesday, 6,300 of those. Again, closing. That was actually closing most of the week. So I'm assuming as we blew through that strike, folks were unloading, getting the heck out of Dodge out of there. About 5,000 on Tuesday, 4,000 on Monday, and about 4,200 today. So it seems like with some of this paper, that perhaps the tumult in the crude oil markets, not exactly done. Let's do a quick scan. through. I mean, again, there's a ton of papers, a million contracts up here, listeners. See if we see any other funky stuff afoot. 125s were also pretty active this week, uh, going up 13,000 times or so in June. 120s also pretty active in July, 13,000 going up there as well. So Kind of your assorted upside strikes were the action out here this week. But those 150s in December, they kind of leap out at me, listeners. If we're hanging out anywhere near those strikes by the end of the year, listeners, this year perhaps has not gone well <laughs> for any of us out there, except for you you crude bulls. You folks are smiling. Everybody else, perhaps not so much. Since we're hanging out in energy, let's do a quick stop in the other product that was dominating everyone's mind share here for quite some time. This is natural gas, listeners. Man, we got a lot to jam into the show today. Just the facts, ma'am, show today, listeners. Going to just keep ramming home a whole bunch of options analytics out here. So uh, fun stuff. We did see Nat Gas taking a bit of a break this week. By the way, get into that energy, pop out of crude oil, go down a couple of slots to natural gas. You'll see LN there. That's the one we're looking at. Let's see how much Nat Gas is on the tape this week. Oh, 418,000 contracts. That's a pretty active week for NatGas. That's kind of what I was expecting. Maybe a little bit more for WTI. Certainly not the 1 million level. That's a lot of paper. But NatGas starting to take a bit of a retreat. Now, if you know anything about NatGas, there's a lot of seasonality to this product, obviously. And so this is typically the time of the year where that seasonality starts to weigh on NatGas because we just saw a big thaw this week. In fact, the shift in temperature just yesterday on Wednesday, of things warming up across the board, took some 5 billion cubic feet of projected demand, at least, off the board for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> so you see how even one day's temperature fluctuation can weigh on these numbers out there. So a lot of people were actually concerned more. For a while there, all the story was upside, upside, upside. So people starting to wonder maybe the, this fair now, the concern is to the downside. Because at the end of the day, this is the product we have to put on tankers and ship overseas if we want to tap into those extreme overseas markets, that extreme overseas demand for LNG, for liquefied natural gas. And there's just a capacity limit to that. There's only so many tankers available. There's only so much we can export. So this is still an American domiciled product. They're, the upside exposure is somewhat capped by just the sheer bandwidth of the export process to get over there to Europe to kind of feed that demand. So there is upside, but it's capped. Whereas the downside, given the fact that we, you know, now there's seasonality kicking in, the export limits are there, there's warmer temperatures coming in. Some people are now a little bit concerned for a little bit more downside retracement. That's pretty much what we saw this week. 
if we just ran the numbers for this week, this would definitely be in our movers and shakers for the dark side. It's off 7.75% this week here in NatCast. Coming into showtime is about 463. So again, coming off uh, quite a bit this week. Uh, we're also seeing maybe, maybe some hopes that they can work around some of the issues with natural gas over there in Europe. And obviously that was what's bidding everything up. You know, it was that demand overseas that was like this black hole, this vortex that was sucking up the U S natural gas numbers. Cause otherwise, like I said before, this is a very localized product typically, but we are in a global commoditized world right now. And when things are crazy overseas, witness wheat, <laughs> we're going to see those at least to a degree echoed and reflected in our markets here. How much paper extended? 418,000 contracts on the tape. Of that, looks like the front April contract doing about 22% of the paper out here. So let's get out there. What is the vol right now in NatGas? This is a product that has been known for some volatility of late. 51 and a half right now. It's off about five and a half points. This thing has hit triple digits multiple times over the course of the past couple of weeks and the past month or two, definitely. Now, let me interesting to see if we see a lot of that continued upside paper going out throughout the rest of the year. We'll get there in a second. First, let's break down the action from a skew perspective here. Last week, the puts 4.3% cheap. This week, 7.4% cheap. And again, I should give all of you a refresher if you're new to the show. I know a lot of you are. When I talk these quick skew numbers, this is the amount of discount or premium from a vol perspective for the 25 delta put. And the 25 delta call, which is your standard measure for a risk reversal, your 50 delta risk reversal. So if I say they're 7.4% cheap now, that is 7.4% below the roughly 51 and a half vol level, which is the at the money vol. So you're getting a discount if you want to come in and scoop some puts right now. The calls last week, 6.9% bid above that at the money vol level. This week, 8.2% bid. So calls remaining juicy. We are trending down. So that's kind of a rotation you might expect in this in this skew, maybe a little bit more aggressive than you might think. But again, these are somewhat aberrant times. Who's to say what is proper in these markets out here? In terms of where the action was, I say we're at about a 463 right now. It seems like the four puts going out in April were dominating the tape. Then again, we had action kind of across the board here, listeners. But this one looks like it is taking the winner, winner chicken dinner this week with about 15,250 contracts. The four puts active throughout the week. The big day was yesterday, 4,600 yesterday, 3,700 on Tuesday, 3,400 on Monday, and 3,400 today. All of that closing pretty much. So a lot of closing action on the four puts. Maybe some folks uh, who had them on thought that was a bit of a bridge too far before March expiration, or they were short them. They wanted to get the heck out of Dodge. Given what we're seeing on the skew out there, I have to probably imagine it's more of the former. We are seeing that downside discount to the puts get exacerbated this week. So probably more sellers than buyers, as the old school old timers used to say when I first walked on the floor of the SIBO out there. And I say, well, why is this stock down? They would say, hey, more sellers than buyers, kid. <laughs> and it turns out all these years later, they were pretty smart folks. Let's keep on rolling out here to, let's see, what is our next most active contract? Looks like it's the four half puts. So pretty much the at the money put doing about 12,000 contracts this week. The big day was today, 3,264. Tuesday, about 3,000. Actually, I take it back. The big day was Monday, almost 5,000 on Monday. Slightly opening there. So you could see that we were kind of threatening that level. Were we going to get close to it again? Were we going to break it? And then uh, 3,000 on Tuesday, 3,200 today. So opening on Monday, Closing looks like throughout most of the rest of the week. But we did see some other prints going on here. Also, it's interesting to see what they're pricing in across the term structures. That'll give us some sense of what they're looking at. And we were talking not that long ago about bids and action for the seven strike going all the way out to October. Do we still see that? Well, we're seeing the six calls trading right now all the way out to October as well. The six calls traded nine, almost 10,000 times in October for this week. So action there. And also, The 10 calls going out to Jan of next year, listeners, 10 calls, 6,100 times, and 10 calls trading 9,000 times in February of next year. My goodness, what is afoot here? It looks like like we've got some funky action, more verticals and or it looks like mostly. So we have 7 half 10 going up on Wednesday. 3,000 times on Wednesday and 3,000 times again today. So maybe they put it on and took it off. That would be 
kind of strange. So seven and a half, ten. Also, the sixes were trading twelve hundred times. So it looks like we have multiple verticals and or strips. So it's like the six, seven, six is traded twelve hundred twenty five times. The sevens traded a thousand times. Seven halves traded three thousand times, and the tens traded three thousand. Looks like the sixes and sevens were closing. So maybe after this big move up, they were taking off their six, seven vertical and rolling it up three x taking off about 1,000 to 1,200 and putting on 3,000. But then they did the exact same numbers again today. 1,200, 1,000, 3,000, and 3,000 again. So looks like they're putting it all on as a pack, unless they had more to go. Uh, yeah, that's a weird vertical, listeners. But it looks like it could have been a roll from the 6.7 to the 7.5.10. So if we're doing 7.5.10 again in January of next year, listeners, then they're looking for a little bit more rock'em sock'em action again that's the seasonal moment when we do expect to see natural seasonal demand for nat gas seven half ten i'll leave it up to you whether you think that's a viable strike here also so looks like seven half calls also trading in march of next year so looks like we have action to the upside throughout all the way to the end of the year and into the beginning of next year so intriguing stuff when we get to the middle of the year which is kind of usually our seasonal Kind of weak spot late summer into September. We're still seeing, let's see, uh, two half puts are trading about 6,000 times this week as well in September. So it's not all extreme upside. <laughs> Looks like it's a 275 two half put spread going up 5,000 times. That's a very tight put spread. <laughs> Someone apparently likes that one. Interesting. So yeah, there is some downside listening, but it looks like it is pretty much dominated by crazy upside plays for quite some time to come, listeners. As we keep on rolling, we got to take a stop now in the equities. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, let's do this thing. Let's dive on into the equities, pop out of that energy drop down, go down a few notches there to equities, and then let's go to the Russell 2000 first. And then we'll expand our horizons from there as needed. By the way, let's set the table from a Vol perspective. Coming into showtime, Vol has been on the topsy-turvy run this week in the equity space, listeners. We've seen dramatic intraday whipsaws, some of the more impressive ones I've seen ever just to this week out there from a, an overall rally, peak to trough, and then back down again, especially on Tuesday of this week. So when we see movement like that, listeners, that translates into volatility. I know everyone's biased to think of downside equals vol. And typically you're correct, but at the end of the day, vol is movement. So think of it that way. And when we have a lot of movement, you shouldn't expect, in, in both directions, you shouldn't expect vol to come in a ton. That's pretty much what we're seeing. Right now, coming at the start of the show, we had RVX, which is the VIX of the small caps, the Russell 2000, right around 36 and a quarter. That's up nearly two points, about one and three quarters points from where it was this time last week. VIX Cash was at about a 31 and a half. That puts it up almost two points as well, 1.85 points. So that spread going to tighten up a little bit, but not a ton. VVIX, which is the vol of vol itself, at about 127. That's up about five points from this time last week. And vol Q, which is the at the money vol of the NASDAQ 100, at about a 32.64, up about two and a quarter points. So that means that VIX to RVX spread, like I said, a little bit tighter, about 0.15 tighter which is pretty much exactly the movement we saw. So that puts it at right around a 470. That's still a little wide. Usually it's around three points and change out there. So that's still a little juicy out there. VIX to vol Q, a little bit more than a point, 1.1 1 .1 points right now. That's about a third of a point wider. And this that spread's been a weird one to watch because some days it, there's no spread. They're trading at the exact same level, which again, given the differences in those products, one's at the money vol, one's at the money vol plus some skew plus the inherent differences in S&P and NASDAQ, even though I know they're kind of similar beasts right now, and that vol would reflect that. Not a huge difference. And maybe we need to bring uh, Scott Nations back on the show and look at a little bit of a historical view on all things NASDAQ vol versus S&P vol, because that is his product at the end of the day. All right, speaking of products, let's go on into the equity drop down. Let's get into all things Russell 2000, hanging out just north of the 2000 level right now, listeners, 2002.6 to be precise. So now net on the week, it's, it's kind of unched, which 
I guess, given everything that's going on, is perhaps to be expected. We know the deal. 31% of the about 25,000 contracts going out in this contract that's going away in one day. So let's go a little bit farther out. Let's go out a whopping eight days to the March contract that has, let's see, about 23% of the paper. So we're still within our two-week frame of reference, but it's kind of a fool's errand to go out much farther in the equities because this is where all the paper is. Everyone and their mother just wants to trade things that die tomorrow in the equities. (laughs) So we shall oblige you here on the show. Where's that ball right now? About 34 and a half in this March contract. That's kind of unched on the week, which again, given all the whipsawing we're seeing out there is maybe to be expected. In terms of the action, everyone wants to know, is it far out of the money puts? Is it small delta calls? Looks like it was the 19 half puts. Again, we're at just, just around the 2,000 levels. 19 half puts going away tomorrow and also active here in March that were kind of dominating the tape throughout the week. Also saw 1960 puts going out in the contract that goes away in about four days, so kind of splitting the uprights there. So a lot of, lot of put action out here, which again, maybe given this week, not exactly surprising. We did see some... Some smaller Delta calls going up as well here in the April contract that has about 35 days to go. The 2180s were pretty active this week. So those, that's your kind of small Delta call, it looks like. Also, 2260s, I take that back. 2260s, also pretty active in the March contract that expired, the end of month March contract that has about 21 days to go. So those 2260s and 2180s, for those of you looking for the small delta calls. Uh, really quickly here on the uh, SKU side, let's, let's go out. We have to go out to this eight-day con. I can't look at SKU with one day to go. That's just absurd. Uh, 12.4% rich were the puts last week. This week, 11%. So the puts actually coming in a little bit. The calls last week, 10.9% cheap this week, 146 Let's just do a quick sojourn through uh, the E-mini S&P because I know a lot of you hang your hats out there as well. And it's been, like, like I said, just a crazy whipsaw week. So pop that out of the Russell 2000, go up to the top of the equities there. You'll see the E-mini S&P 500. How much paper this week, listeners? Oh, 3.25 million contracts on the tape. Man, the E-mini does some paper. Once we come away from the 3,600 puts, <laughs> again, we're at a 42 double right now on the S&P, so 4,255. The 3,600 puts did 116,000 cut. So these people are just harvesting so much. <laughs> and if that's not enough for you, the 3,200 puts going out in four days did 32,000 cut. So let's take all that noise out of the equation, listener. Let's go a little bit farther out, see if we can find something a little bit saner. And again, we have to kind of keep most of our eyes near to the closer expirations let's tell you what let's go out again same distance a march contract that goes out on on the 18th so the weekly has about eight days to go the four thousand puts so the par puts were pretty active this week again we're at 42 double people are wondering they're concerned about that four thousand level so it doesn't exactly surprise me that that's what we would see out here this week by the way that contract the vol right now 28 pretty much even off about half a point so again not a huge vol change and you shouldn't expect it given how much we're whipsawing out there right now the puts, though, that's interesting. Last week, the puts were 11.6% bid. This week, 18.1%. I expect those puts to get a little bit more juice in them. But the calls last week, 9.7% cheap. This week, 18.5% cheap. So if you want a cheap upside flyer in the S&P 500, they're getting pretty cheap out there. In terms of the action, like I said, the 4,000 puts trading actively all week, thirty almost 31,000 contracts. The big day was Monday, 9,400. 8,800 on Tuesday, 6,500 on Wednesday, 5,600 today. So slightly less every day this week. Closing every day, pretty much. So it seems like people are just taking off 4,000 puts like it's going out of style. Also, 28,000 of the 4,100 puts also going up this week. Same deal, pretty much early in the week. That's when they were hot and heavy and petering out. Actually, doing 6,000 still today. So pretty active today. But it looks like closing throughout most of the week as well. So 4,200 puts, same deal, 25,000 of those active all week long, mostly closing. So folks, perhaps deciding within the next week, we're not going to get down those levels, taking off the 4,200s, 4,100s, and 4,000 puts. So you guys also asked for medals. Let's see if we can hang our hats out there next. It's time to explore the options activity in silver, gold, and other shiny things. It's time to talk metals. Woo, 
run out of voice listeners breaking down all these complexes for you. But you know what? We love you folks. You ask, we shall deliver here. You want a little bit of shiny stuff in your lives? We got you covered. Let's get on out to that drop down. Pop out of equities. We're going to go all the way down to the bottom of that asset class, to the metals, then to the top of the product family, which is the next menu. And you're going to go to precious metals. And then the next sub menu beyond that product, we're going to go to gold. And that's where we're hanging out right now. The big story outside of the wheat and the crude oil this week, of course, listeners, and the equity whip sawing has been gold. Gold, like I said, finally catching up, finally doing its thing. North of the 2000 level, again, listeners, finally out there, 2006.6 as we come to this portion of the show. Listen, it's up 40 points exactly or a little over 2.3%. Let's see, last Friday, gold was hanging out at 1879 and then it shot all the way up to, let's see, the high was 2043. That was on Tuesday of this week before starting to give it up the rest of the week. In terms of action, how much action is up in gold right now? Wow, 480,000 contracts. That is that is nothing to sneeze at. Usually gold is less than half of that or maybe around half of that. So, wow, that's a lot of paper in gold, listeners. Okay, and of that, about a third, 32% going up in the April contract. that has about 18 days to go, so we're going to hang out out there. It's perfect, right at our, right at our frame of reference, listeners. Now, let's see, vol and gold. Gold not known for a lot of vol. It's got some juice right now. 23 and three quarters, up nearly a full vol point. If you know anything about gold vol, if you listen to us for a long time, you know it can catch a bid. That is not unheard of. The question always is whether it can maintain that bid. Let's look really quickly, see if we can dig into a little bit of this gold vol here. How high did it get out here? That's what we want to see. Got up to 29 80, so almost a 30 vol list. That was on the 8th, so a couple of sessions ago. So a 30 vol in gold, that is nothing to sneeze at, listeners. And obviously, the answer for can it maintain that right now is no. It's at about 23 and three quarters. So when you get these gold spikes in vol, listeners, you might want to fade it. That seems to be what history tells us. Again, wait till it peters itself out first. You don't want to catch a falling knife to the upside in vol, so catch an exploding dagger to the face pretty much. But once it starts retreating, it can come off pretty aggressively. So intriguing stuff out there in gold vol. Something we've seen a lot in crypto vol as well, starting to mimic that. It can catch a bid, and then it kind of comes right back down. Gold's, though, still, still fairly elevated at about 23 and three quarters. So it hasn't given up all the juice yet. be interesting to see how, uh, how much. Let me just look really quickly and see how low we got on the vol spectrum here. Let's see, a week ago. Where we're a week ago, I said we were at about a, we were at a 14, a little over a week. This is the end, late February, February 23rd. Gold vol was a 1485. So it doubled from between the 23rd of February and the 8th, from about a 15 to about a 30 before coming back down to about a 23 and change. That's a huge move in gold vol. So if you faded that top of that, well done. You're looking pretty good out there right now. In terms of skew, let's see. Last week, the put 6.3% cheap. This week, 5.8% cheap. And the call is 9.6% bid last week. This week, 7.7% bid. You know, that's kind of what we expect as we move up the skew curve a little bit. But you might think if we were worried about giving up some of this ghost, we'd see a little bit more juice on those puts. And we're not exactly seeing. They're kind of maintaining their level, which in and of itself is is interesting. But you think maybe a little bit more juice, especially as we rally, you expect those puts to catch a bit of a bid. The fact that they're not catching much of a bid and actually giving up a little bit of juice maybe shows there's a little bit more selling pressure out there than we think. Maybe folks are not thinking we're retreating this time below the 2000 level anytime soon, which again, looking at our broad equity polls we have going on out there and everything else is kind of in line with that. People are not expecting this tumult to end anytime soon. It looks like this gold product going out about 19 days is not expecting that either. In terms of the most active contract, it was the 2,100 calls, listeners, doing, let's see, about 16,000 contracts this week. The big day, well, it was kind of even all week until today. It kind of fell off a cliff today. But Monday, about 6,000, mostly opening. Uh, Then Tuesday, 5,000, mostly closing. Wednesday, 4,500, also mostly closing. Today, only 600 and change. Not a lot of paper going up today. And that, so 2,100, which again was... 
folks were looking for us to really explode through that strike. And once we started coming back towards the 2000 level, starting to get the heck out of Dodge on those upside call strikes. Let's look really quickly, see what else we see out here when it comes to gold. 2200s. That's, that's aggressive, but they were trading pretty well this week as well. 12,500 of the 2200s going up this week. The big day for those was yesterday. 5,000 going up yesterday. 4,000 on Monday. 3,100 on Tuesday. Again, kind of back and forth all week long on those. So no, no direct bias to the flow there. Let's look really quickly to see if we see any other weird prints. You know, when it comes to gold, gold's kind of the king of the longer term weird upside prints. Let's see how many. We saw the 5,000s go up a couple of weeks ago. I need to go back and dig into those again. Listen, that's just, I think the technical term for that is crazy town. But it seems like the 2100s, 2100 was a strike du jour this, this whole week. 2100 calls going up 6,000 times in June, 3,000 times in July, 5,300 times in August out there. Yeah, it looks like about 6,000 times in September. 2,300 times in October. <laughs> so 2,100s across the board, that was the most active strike this week. Looks like longer term, not to be undone. We have the 2,500s went up about 7,000 times this week, listeners. So 1,400 on Tuesday, 3,100. That was the big day. That was on Tuesday and 2,100 today. It looks like opening throughout most of the week. So opening paper on the 2,500s. Someone also took off about 5,000 of the 2275s on Monday as well. So weird paper afoot to the upside in Dece, as there always is in gold. But I do need to go back. We need to do an update on those 5,000s because that was some crazy paper indeed. All right, everybody. I think that's about all my voice can handle. Thankfully, <laughs> that's also the end of the program. I'm just kidding. We love breaking down all things futures options for you out there. Kind of a just the facts, ma'am, edition for you this week. Filling it up from start to finish with all the products we could squeeze in in one hour. We touched on a bunch of ags, a bunch of energy products, got some equities in there, got some gold and precious and we still didn't have a chance to touch on everything. This show, weeks like this, it could easily be three hours. I don't know if my voice could handle it. I know a lot of you would like that, though. So if you have products you want us to talk about, feature on the show in upcoming episodes. Hopefully they do a little bit of options. Paper, that's all we really ask. If it does 30 options contracts a week, it's kind of hard for us to parse it. Hence the palladiums and all the other, the oats. We didn't talk about oats because they don't really do a lot of uh, options paper out there but if you have a product you want to see it. by the way i was right my guess on palladium i said three contracts <laughs> it has done exactly three contracts this week so that's why we don't talk about it on the show this week listeners. <laughs> but if you have a product you want us to talk about hit us up let us know we're not shy about giving our listeners what they want and of course if you guys want more access to all this data outside of when you're listening to this show, you know where to go. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O. That's the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires on all this stuff. So if you want to check Palladium by yourself on your own time, we won't judge. If you want to analyze all three contracts, <laughs> looks like the 2470 puts, right now it's trading 29 and a half. The 2470 puts traded twice in May, and the 2500 puts traded once in June. There you go. I gave you a whole week's run now. By the way, the ball right now in Palladium, 67 and a quarter front month ball. There you go. I did it all for you. <laughs> but if you want to do that yourself on any of the products that trade at CME, cmegroup.com slash twifo is the place to go. And of course, if you're getting a little bit more involved in these products, maybe you want to up your game, you want to use the pro level tools that I use here throughout the show, bantix.com, B A N T I X.com is the place to go to try out the full suite, the full offering of what Nick and his team have available. And trust me, it's a lot. It's a lot of amazing content. Their tagline is very apt. All the information you can't find all in one place. If you're more intrigued by these markets, we know a lot of you really are these days. Bantix.com is the place to go. Tell them we sent you, Nick. We'll be super happy. And if you know Nick, you know it takes a lot to make him really happy. So <laughs> if you tell him that, he'll be through the moon. And of course, you know where to go to learn more about all things small caps, 
FTSERussell.com. F-T-S-E, Russell.com is the place to go for their COVID impact info on recon. What's going on with correlation? Why are small caps performing versus this index by X percent? They have all that data and a whole bunch more. Of course, give them a follow on the old Twitter machine as well. At FTSE Russell, F-T-S-E Russell, all one word. That's going to do it for our broadcast day today. Listeners, I want to thank all of you for joining us live in the Secret Club for After the Fact. We love you all. We'll be back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views. After that, for all you cool kids in the Secret Club at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern for options oddities. And then back again next week, another episode of This Week in Futures Options. Stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.